We need to get Alan back to sea. Whilst the mighty port town of Hartlepool has been a genuinely welcoming, albeit expensive, place to spend a few days each week since arriving during the stormy weather back in leg three, we have a schedule. And even in its pared back form, this means reaching a fair way along the Scottish coast before the end of the summer, when I need to have Alan lifted out of the water until the spring. To remind you, this is the eventual aim, getting Alan to the Arctic via Norway. I decided not to cross the North Sea to Norway now, due to delays caused largely by a pretty unsettled summer, as it would mean flying back and forth to the famously affordable Norway through the winter to further modify and update the boat. But the delay this August has been beyond a joke, even by Alan's obtuse comic standards, and we'll end up starting a shell fish farm on the hull if we don't pull our fingers out. Although there have been periods of relative calm, easterlies have dominated the summer, which are not the prevailing winds for the British Isles. As a result, we've endured onshore winds and plenty of swell. But not always, especially with recent frustrating days working at the marina when I'd rather be taking advantage of good spells. The weather is fine and calm now, and uh, my limitation is crew. Uh, I put out word amongst the marina now, uh, although their Facebook group takes forever to get approved to and so you can be allowed to post. But anyway, I've spoken to the marina crew and they're putting the word out too. Uh, yeah, really, like tomorrow, Wednesday and Thursday are absolutely great. It's getting now quite short notice and it's really tomorrow, which is Wednesday and then Thursday, that are going to have the, the good calm weather, which could give us the opportunity to do a good like, 100 miles or so. Uh, so this is pretty frustrating. I'll just get as much work done as I can on board. But really, I just need um, someone to, to grab the mooring lines now. And it's so frustrating because uh, it's just down to people's holiday clashes and you know, it's late August. Uh, people are either abroad or doing other things, and uh, because otherwise I would find it quite straightforward. Before we jubilantly power northward, let's run through a few upgrades. We left off with the new autopilot, uh, squared up I guess, expectant in an off-cut of wood sort of way, but not actually finished. Given the fortnight of episode hiatus, I hope we haven't lost any channel subscribers to emotional breakdowns as a direct result of this. As promised, I had a custom-made plate of solid aluminium made up and then rounded off the edges to minimise its potential to attack human occupants. I added a splodge or two of sealant so rogue moisture cannot gain entry and then securely screwed down the plate on which the electric raymarine thingy can work its magic. The pin at the base of the pilot needs to seat into the brass socket and that socket must be absolutely solid. I knew I'd have to shim a little to get the pilot body as flat as possible so I made a little reinforcement stack made of stainless washers and epoxy resin. Also, the new tiller extension tube finally arrived, and having hammered some beach doweling inside and epoxied the other pin into place, it was ready to mate with the other end of the tiller pilot ram. We've seen this astounding display of extension and retraction before, but in the interest of completeness, here I can prove that in manual mode, I can steer the rudder. But there's more. What am I doing? I'm finding somewhere for the tiller pilot to live when it's not doing its tiller piloting. And because instead of putting it away in its box, which will take ages to get it out again, I want somewhere nearby where it can be stowed safely. So it's going to be face down to protect the screen and the buttons here on this pad that I've made. And there's going to be a restraint here, which I'm about to um, drill into the, the fiberglass there. So this should be a neat way of keeping it out of the way when the tiller is just going to be controlled by the wheel. And uh, then within yeah, 30 seconds or so, you'd be able to install the pilot and get that going. Plus, a few of you asked about the wisdom of having the special soundproofing mat too near the exhaust. I'm using quite a lot of this uh, mass-loaded vinyl mat, the Tech Sound, and some of it's going to be not right next to, but in the vicinity of things like the exhaust pipe, which is lagged, but still near things that are going to get quite warm. So I thought I'd just do a quick burn test. I'm pretty sure that because they have to go with all the building regs, that they're going to be um, uh, not flame-proof, but at least fire retardant. But I'll just give it a go with a, with a lighter to see what sort of effect prolonged flame has on it. Clever stuff. Next, I've gone around the railings and drilled a series of 6mm holes in a few different areas. This isn't a new hobby of mine, or a complex in reaction to the frustration of not being in the water heading north, but no, I had an idea. I bought a load of coarse thread quarter inch bolts at a certain length. This spec is otherwise known as one of the two main tripod mount screw sizes. The idea being that I don't have to rely on clamps or straps or other ways to attach action cameras and so on. Since I'm putting them in half a dozen locations, it means my cinematographic genius can manifest without the encumberment of slow camera mounting. Well done, and back to the journey. I still have tons of diesel from back at the beginning along the Thames estuary when we fueled up both Alan's day tank and this 100 gallon bladder. 
Alas, whilst the genuinely impressive product, for my application here it's run its course. They are easy to strap down when empty and indeed full up, but they form a weird shape when half full and can't be securely held down without aggressively creasing the skin. A replacement is nigh and all will be revealed this autumn. Well somehow I've made it here. Tried to set off this morning at about 6.30 to get the early train up and there was total chaos on the railways. First train ended up being sent back to London because it broke. Grand Central are absolutely hopeless at running trains and talking to people and generally doing anything of any use. And so I ended up getting up to Durham and then I got the bus across to Hartlepool because it was basically the only way for me to get here uh, at a reasonable hour because I needed to set things up before the other two guys turn up later on. And then more train chaos down in London. Um, Tarek had to get on to a backup train because his initial train um, he couldn't get to because another train had failed to come into Paddington Station. So it's been quite a day, but the sun is shining. Alan is still here, which is great news. And hopefully in a few hours we can get ourselves set up and ready to go in the morning. Two adventurous souls have volunteered for this final leg of the summer. Time to go welcome crew number number one. Right. Two of us are here. A third has just arrived, apparently. Um, say hello to Louis. Hi, guys. Oh, you, you, you got a bit of guttering in the way. There we are. There we go. There we are. There we are. There we are. There we are. Brilliant. So we'll, we'll go over to the train station now and go and find him. Hopefully he won't be lost. Oddly, we were led astray by a pub on the way back, although I came prepared for such an eventuality with a laptop and mapping. So officially, we can call this a working dinner. I bought some cordoned off smoked salmon for our breakfast bagels and then back to Alan. And we are ready for some sleep before we head off in the morning. But we do now have our second member of crew. And I'm going to turn the camera around at exactly the right moment. I think this is what they call a theatrical pause. <laughs> Say hello to everyone, Zara. Hello, <laughs> <that's you. laughs> The weather gods had, that morning, apparently broken ranks with the YouTube gods and served us calmness, serenity and warm light. It's 6.30 and I'm going to go and have a shower. We're not allowed to lock out until about 8, but we'll try and get through maybe 7.45 ish so we can get on the road quickly. But um, anyhow, there's almost no wind. It seems rather pleasant. Um, everyone seems to have had a good night's sleep, so I think we have a good start. I did pass by the harbour entrance, a dramatic double set of piers, and thought back to the large waves that greeted us to Hartlepool when we chose to divert here for our safety. We pushed off at around half seven, about as early as the marina team were happy to operate the lock gates, and since it was a pleasant Sunday, expected we'd not be the only ones in there. Community spirited, as ever, I'd pre-warned the staff and had been granted permission to enter first. The sigh of relief from the other skippers was audible across the harbour. It was fun to head into the empty inner harbour as we awaited the radio call to motor in. Well, it wasn't not fun. OK, it was a neutral to positive experience. This area leads to the Royal Navy Museum and offers a sheltered area for other sorts of water sports and for teaching kids to sail or kayak. The call came and Alan thundered over, through and alongside. No major collisions and no trying to make friends with the walls of the lock, so we can call that progress of sorts. Welcome again to Team Allen. We've got into the lock without any major calamity. Oh, there's Derek. <laughs> and we're now awaiting a third boat to come through before we head off through the lock out into the Great North Sea. Three other boats motored in behind us, two onto the pontoon and a third rafted to the rearmost. I won't name names, but one of them did actually thump pretty hard into the pontoon without a fender in place, but I wouldn't have wanted to have to be the one sliding into a small gap. The lock gates parted once more, and since it was only an hour or so after low tide, it took a few moments for the water level to match. Alan was unleashed, past the piers, keeping in mind that the stream is quite narrow and is not marked by buoys, and then we caught sight of the breakwater near the headland. The same one that had delivered such relief as we sought refuge from the large waves on our entry. The other boats, being longer and therefore faster, nipped past once there was space, and went off to fish, survey and so on. But Alan had one simple job on this occasion, keep going north, just to keep going and avoid drama. And the weather was on our side, calm with no swell as the winds had been southwesterlies for days. I'll tell you what, leaving Hartlepool is a very different experience to arriving at Hartlepool. The first job was to clear the area around the Middlesbrough port channel, greet Alan's cousin aboard this tanker and then promptly get around to breakfast. 
This time was soft cheese, salmon and bagels, but we also had pancakes and an assortment of other health foods. We passed Blythe, a place I'd only heard of because an actor in a Royal Navy advertisement pretended to be born there, but it seemed pleasant enough. Something quite serious has happened and that is that so far today I have not shown you a single wind farm, but I have a solution. Just outside of Blythe, they have put out these new experimental ones. I think they're like a development uh, wind farm. And we are aiming straight for it, and we're going to ride straight through. But for that, I'm actually going to go up and go to manual control. I don't think autopiloting for a wind farm is a very good idea. Anyhow, imagine the excitement. A wind farm. This, in fact, is a demonstration wind farm just offshore from Blythe. There are not nearly enough wind turbines already built and functioning up the east coast of the UK and so I can see exactly why there'd need to be a demonstration before committing to a full wind farm of their own here. The turbine blades went around in circles, so we can assume it met with success. How's it going, Helmsman? It's good, it's good. We've been going for about three hours. Uh, I'd say we're, yeah, we're doing pretty well. We're coming up to, um, coming up to Newcastle, so. Well, nearly Sunderland, let's not, let's not forget Sunderland. Let's not forget Sunderland, you're right. I'm sure they wouldn't appreciate that. <laughs> Yeah. Um, had a few gannets fly past, uh, saw, saw a um, dolphin breach, yeah. which was quite nice. Actually, Tarek got some footage of it. Yeah, so perfect. Awesome. Um, and we're making just over four knots. Yeah, we're doing pretty which, well. Which, against the wind, is fine. Uh, yeah. Eagle-eyed viewers will note that Louis wasn't holding the wheel. This is not because Louis is a negligent sort. In fact, we had a robot in charge. Alan's auto helm was doing its job straight out the box secure on the double pin mount, which before you see it in action might actually seem a wobbly strategy, we set a heading and it was following it. The heading wasn't accurate, but we soon learned the deviation, and presumably a calibration can sort that out. It's also being run independently, and not plugged into anemia backbone to integrate with a chart plotter, GPS, wind sensor, and so on. It can be forgiven, but the auto helm's reaction to heading off course, perhaps due to a wave, is not instant, and so we weaved a little, perhaps 10 degrees to each side. I think it's also some way behind a human when correcting for each wave in order to smooth out the ride, but in calm conditions it was nice to sit up in the helm seat and merely be on watch, and able to plan the course and so on, hands off the wheel. I didn't buy the absolute rip-off of a remote control, so we used crewmates when asking for a degree left or a degree right. This glimpse of the engine bay heat extractor reminds me, I've added an internal probe thermometer to see how the double fan system is getting on. An air temperature of 65 degrees at the hottest part of the bay isn't quite good enough yet, but we are engaged in a titanic struggle between cooling and soundproofing here. We motored yet further, now north of the industrial zone between Middlesbrough and North Shields, the mouth of the Tyne that leads to where we aimed to end up on that previous leg. This meant a more rural coastline, a mixture of rocky headlands, beaches and the occasional village. I had earmarked a small marina at Amble for our overnight, but the tide limited access to just a few hours per high water. So I went back up top to scheme. We've had a few spots of rain, but it's been a nearly flat calm. Uh, there's only about five miles an hour of wind with a tiny gust every now and again, so we really can't complain. This is the North Sea after all. And we're just uh, coming past a few lobster pots. Uh, reminds me of Scarborough. And we're going to go past Amble. You can just about make out there's a lighthouse on an island over there. And instead, we're actually going to go past Amble to a place called Almouth, where we think we'll find ourselves a more sheltered anchorage for the night. And still somewhere where we can go ashore, stretch our legs, and so on. So we'll go and do that. Alan was enjoying the mill pond we'd happened upon. Even the sporadic summer showers didn't spoil our day, and we were now well beyond the day's projected mileage. We found a sheltered beach off Almouth Village and set about anchoring on the sandy seabed. The anchor system is my design, so I wasn't at the helm, leaving Louis and Tarek to work out how it works. The anchor is stored outside and the chain inside. They need to be connected for use with a hex key shackle in order to keep everything neat and watertight at sea. We could even chance our arm coming a little bit closer in maybe. I mean, kind of like 10, 20 meters, like not much, but you know, every meter is a meter saved. Cool, if, if that's the case, I think it's, um, it starts to shadow quite quickly then. So are, are you ready for us to drop? Uh, yeah, ready for you to drop. 
Okay, we'll start dropping it about 10 seconds or so. Do I need a little pouch near the bow hatch for the walkie-talkie? Yes, I do. But anyhow, the anchor ends up in the water the way many of them do, and after the 9 metres of chain are down on the sand, I measure out the right amount of rope so we're somewhere in the middle of the recommended 3, 4 or 5 to 1 ratio to high water depth. For some reason the mooring line was still around the post, instead of off and inside the boat, something I should have noticed, and so I tied it off as well as I could. Thankfully it was a large post with enough space. The tracking on the navigation software comes in particularly useful in this event, as it shows how well your anchor is bitten, even if reference points on the shoreline aren't great at warning you if you're dragging. So um, so this is going to track exactly where we are to make sure that we're not moving around too much. Yeah, so this is where we dropped the anchor and then we started backing down as we let the anchor um, rope out. And then this is where we first stopped and you can see that the chain then pulled us forwards again. And we, to make sure the anchor was really nice and bedded, we backed down it quite hard, but it's pulled the chain tight as well, all the way back to here. And then as the chain came uh, back onto the seabed, it pulled us forwards a little bit. All right, front hatch is closed. Yes, this one is closed. Yes, top one doesn't really matter. That, yeah, that one will do in a second. It was time to abandon Alan and head to shore for, firstly, a test of the new dinghy, whose name I'll unveil in part two, and because we fancied a leg stretch and a pub meal. I hopped in first, having moved the towing lines over to Alan's starboard post. The dinghy now has two equalised tow lines, plus a damper, so as to minimise the chance of him wandering off, as Alanson did when we were last at sea. It's rated to carry a weight approaching half a tonne, but with human beings the issue is going to be space, and not how many pies we've eaten. With a little shuffling, Tarek on the bow, me on the bench and Louis at the stern, we rode onward well trimmed. It was a shallow beach and so a fair way in. Okay, right, I'll put my legs out there. Just tighten this up. This is Allenson's first, first voyage. Yeah, despite having incurred... Oh, that's interesting. I've just noticed. So the whole, the whole throttle pod rotates as opposed to just the rudder. Yes, yeah, yeah. That was the only way that it um, that it used to steer. I didn't so, have a rudder at all. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, right, so there's, there's no feathering. And that way it's all more like an uh, outboard. Almost. I guess, yeah, yeah, I guess so, yeah, yeah. Well, this is very intimate. <laughs> What would be useful would be to have this seat a little bit further forward because at the moment I'm like falling off the front of it. Uh, yeah, I guess a few inches. I think maybe when we get to the beach that might be a good thing to do because I'm kind of falling off the front of it. Obviously, as we approached the beach, the waves grew and broke. A hitherto dry voyage was now at risk. Got a wave coming up behind you. See if my bum gets wet. Woo! Not too bad. Probably just one more way to go. Oh, here goes my oars. Yeah! <laughs> right. I got a wet okay. ass. Right, I, I put the oars down, so... <laughs> <laughs> there we go. So we got slightly wet, in the surf only. <laughs> Could be worse. Tarek said 100% again. <laughs> And Alan is still there. Well, <laughs> we're walking back to the inflatable to get back on the boat, and um, it's raining, which is not what we ordered. Um, but anyway, at least there's no wind. That's good news. There we are. We've got that much water. <laughs> Let's set off towards Alan, who is over there. Right, Alan's over there. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm just going to explain as I'm paddling canoe style, um, what's just happened, I'll point my um, my torch down so it's not blinding the camera. Um, so we just pushed off from the beach and uh, it turned out that one of the oar locks, literally the only part of this boat that I criticised in the early initial uh, unboxing review, uh, one of them broke. So one of the little uh, thumb screws just is no longer there, despite being very carefully used on our way in, literally on the first ever outing on the water. Uh, and so we're now having to, with one of the uh, oar locks broken and unable to be used sort of ad hoc, we're now having to paddle like a canoe, which bizarrely works just as well as rowing. Um, but I'm pretty disappointed because, uh, come on Talamex, 
if you're going to design an ore lock, which is all or nothing, you've got to make one that works. Um, and uh, we're about, what, 200 metres from Mellon now? So yes, I'm not delighted with Tanamex, who lock you into using their ore system without any sort of universal backup alternative. Well, that was interesting, wasn't it? Yeah. Another day in paradise. I mean, we succeeded, and we're all mostly dry. How are you feeling, Louis? Feeling a bit damp, but apart from that, pretty good. <laughs> Had a nice lasagna for dinner. Well, that was worth it then. We slept. You don't need to see that. Good morning from day two. And we are still in the same bay that we went to sleep in, which is an excellent start. You can see it behind me. There's the proof. You don't have to take my word for it. And I still have two crewmates, no mutual media yet. Not quite. Hey Tarek, hey Louis. Morning. Everyone's here, we're all tidying up, getting rid of a little bit of condensation. Not too much, luckily, because um, I've insulated the boat so expertly. And uh, we're going to probably get underway before we have breakfast. And um, yeah, make our way up to the farms and then Linda's farm. Yeah, with a little bit of a breeze, we're gonna have to watch for slamming hatches. Yeah. Beautiful. Okay, we're ready, let's switch on. Sounding good. Make sure the pressure's good. Yep, five bar. I pulled the anchor up as Louis slowly motored us forward to take up the weight and then reversed the system from the evening before. It's much, much more efficient than on previous trips when we had to use the hatch itself, a recipe for disaster in bad weather. The chain lives in one bucket beneath the generator mounting and the rope in another. It helps keep everything untangled. The anchor is dissuaded from an unauthorised departure with a pin on the bow roller plus a shackle at the tail end. For the time being, the sea remained friendly and the angle of the coastline meant neither a growing breeze nor a competing northwesterly swell got us, yet. We passed the castle, we were now firmly into the territory of coastal castles, tons of them, almost tediously so. No, not really, they are very smart. Alan deals with waves on the bow well, and that's what the swell gave us once deny the shelter of the bay, comfortable enough still for crew to catch some extra sleep with the podcast on. The pitching is slow and predictable. We're not a million miles from the Farn Islands now. I think what we're gonna do is head for Inner Farn, because it may well be that Inner Farn and Outer Farn are fairly comparable and we don't want to add unnecessary miles, but we'll, we'll go see what's what. There's a bit of a swell from the uh, from the northeast, and so we're gonna go and try and hide from that around the western side of uh, Inner Farn. And then hopefully, once we've got our fill of the wildlife, we can then head over to Bamburgh Castle and along to Holy Island. Uh, the weather is really quite pleasant. This is the westernmost of the larger islands that make up the Farns. These are a nature reserve and famous for their wildlife, history and stark geology. Boat trips out here are frequent and set off from all the adjacent villages, including sea houses. We arrived early but were soon caught up to by larger and faster tourist boats. We were steering manually now and this told me that I need to make a more solid bolted joint between the rudder post and the new tiller extension. This friction fit jiggling is far from amusing. We motored around and looked and looked. Yes, there were some birds, fulmars, cormorants and so on, but sadly it was nothing like the last time I was here years ago. Firstly, avian flu has hit this coastline to an awful extent, and it was high tide. This means that there aren't that many flattish areas of rock and so on for seals to haul themselves onto and rest. The tourist boat skipper clearly knew the shallows like the back of his hand, but we stayed in a more conservative area. Swathes of the farms are dry at low tide and wet at high tide. The bit in the middle is the worrying time when the local knowledge really counts. We decided the inner farm was indeed not enough and so made the crossing to the outer islands. This was an opportunity for a new experience. Alan and I have fought three or four knot tides on our bow before but never a proper tidal race caused by a channel constriction as you get here between the islands. Sure, it's not the 12 knots or so that the Northern Isles can throw at you, but it was interesting to see the water bubble up in the far shallows and get a feel for how Alan's high torque propeller grabs the water. The old and abandoned structures were interesting, and there was some bird life, but this was about the nearest we got to seriously exotic species. So, we abandoned our Far Islands odyssey and decided to motor on, firstly back to the coastline and via the grand and imposing Bambara Castle, the largest on this stretch. From this point, up across the Scottish border and towards the Forth, we'd entered the tourism zone. 
with impressive cliffs, islands, bird colonies, giant rocks and so on, passenger boats and rib rides are going to become a more common feature. That swell from before has more or less gone, it's really quite calm now, uh, a little bit of a headwind and we're heading past Bamra Castle, who you can see behind me, no it's a castle not a person, and we're heading towards Holy Island which is directly in front of me. Uh, you can see the, the castle, you can't quite make out the Priory, but of course hundreds of years ago there were Norwegian raiders on Holy Island, Lindisfarne, and now of course a Norwegian made lifeboat and Allenson, the Norwegian, well German but we'll give him a Norwegian name, Allenson III is going to go ashore and hopefully not ransack the Priory all over again. On this leg we're quite likely to avoid marinas altogether and so that means anchoring each evening if we're not going to commit to some sort of punitive round-the-clock travel. And given that we'll have observers with exacting standards, I've been improving the area at that bow end. For this, think back to Hartlepool and a roll of super heavy duty waterproof anti-slip flooring we've carried all this way. It's going to form the top of a step that sits atop the structure I built to protect the generator and serve as an aid for crew working the anchor. I've already foam edged three sides of this solid board that comes with plastic veneer and just need to measure the wraparound size and then do the chopping. Back inside the boat, I've prepared the anchor chain conduit that's being bolted to the frame at the top and at the bottom to the giant solid steel remnants of Alan's old davit release mechanism. This needs to be done before I fix the shelf in and should stop the anchor chain thwacking into vulnerable parts. This should make a big difference when we head in and out of anchorages and speed up the process which I can see it is never going to be a match for a fully mechanised electrically powered anchor release and recovery system. This is now ready for dropping, the conduit screw cap off, the chain and anchor secured together with a stainless low profile swivel shackle and me knelt ready to deploy at a moment's notice. Precision anchoring is the name of the game as we approach the world famous holy island of Lindisfarne. The island is only two or three miles wide west to east and at low tide there's a causeway you can drive across from the mainland. Today it's home to a small village, those poor souls inundated by year-round tourism but not as poor as those souls living here in the year 793 when a rather uncouth bunch of Norwegian sailors turned up on the beach and laid waste to the church and inhabitants. Sadly, that structure is long gone, but there's still plenty built since, and I will show you. First though, we headed to the small boat mooring area, avoiding the little harbour itself, which dries out at low tide, and we needed to get going the next morning at, yes, low tide. This meant weaving between a handful of fishing boats on permanent private moorings, finding a spacious location that wouldn't inconvenience them, and dropping anchor. Well, apologies for missing that anchoring extravaganza, but um, I pressed the wrong button on the DJI and I was supposed to be paying attention to the anchor, which is probably the priority at that time. Anyhow, as you can see, the evidence is such we have anchored, we are where we're supposed to be, we haven't pressed into any other boats, which is always a bonus, and uh, we're now going to just hold station for a little bit to make sure that we're not drifting anywhere and that we shouldn't be, and we can go ashore. There's Alan, and there's Derek, and there is Lindisfarne, where we're going to go ashore. Right, making enormous good use of yourself, Derek. So having nearly come ashore, but anchored in a Norwegian built lifeboat. We're now going ashore in Addison the Third, uh, ashore at Lindisfarne, just hundreds of years after the first attack was made on the, uh, the poor souls who lived here. We're not going to probably indulge in the activities that they did. Um, we'll try and be a little bit better behaved. Anyhow, welcome to Lindisfarne. Having landed, I look back in that rather overprotective way I imagine most boat owners do when they have entrusted its safety to a 15 kilo piece of steel connected to a chain and rope, and have done so fewer times than the number of fingers on one hand. But Alan remained, and still remained as we walked around the edge of the inner harbour. Our first tourist destination was the dominating feature of the castle on the southeast corner. It's not remotely of the Viking or Anglo-Saxon age, only about five or six hundred years old in fact, and rather disappointingly has descended in sequence from True Castle to Coast Guard Lookout to Publishing Tycoon Holiday Home to today's use as a pricey museum, wedding venue and film set. All the land around it once acted as grazing for livestock, gardens and space for lime kilns. The three of us retreated down to the little village, which is apparently likely to have been built on the remains of that original church community raided by the Norse attackers, and to the ruins of the Priory. While certainly much older than the castle, it was built by Norman monks in the 12th century. 
This can sometimes be mistaken for the structure sacked in that 8th century attack, but, well, it isn't. So now you know. It's very smart though, in a sort of ruined, no longer complete sort of way. So I will make one further tenuous and laboured reference to the Viking raid, Alan's own Norwegian pedigree, and then return to the real business, which was getting us back to him for a good night of sleep. As it happens on this occasion, the Norwegian boat's landing on Lindisfarne hasn't been quite so unpleasant as the one before, and we'll leave it in exactly the state that we found it in. The winds, whilst likely to change direction overnight, were forecast to remain low, although we did need to keep an eye on our position as the strong tides changed, as I'd read a couple of reports of boats needing to reset their anchor in the middle of the night. So the three of us readied for days three and four, forecast to be trickier than these two straightforward passages. Until I've got around to cutting together part two of this leg, busy yourselves by re-watching this episode, and indeed all my other episodes, read my books too, and of course, get cross with each other in the comment section. Bye.